So when we're talking about next generation eDNA approaches for detecting ANS, it's important to keep in mind the first generation or what, what was done previously. So provide a little bit of historical perspective on environmental DNA. And I always like to give a shout out to the microbiologists who were really doing this first. They didn't call it environmental DNA, but they were actively doing that because if you look at this plate here of bacteria growing and culture, trying to sort out like what each of those different species of bacteria is, is a real challenge. And um, some of the genetic techniques were first used to figure out things that they literally could not figure out by growing the microbes in culture. So they used it for identifying algal blooms, uh, fecal contamination in water supplies, identifying pathogens in the environment, and fully characterizing microbiomes. But continuing on, uh, other wildlife researchers figured out, hey, we can do the same thing. We can look at scat, for example, to figure out wh what uh, is this particular species that I'm interested in eating. They can um, collect saliva samples from dead, endangered species to figure out what was the predator that killed it. They analyzed feathers from birds to figure out what species of birds were using this habitat. And all of this is being done before the, the term environmental DNA was actually coined, which happened in 2008 with this French group who used eDNA to um, survey ponds for American bullfrogs, which are highly invasive over in Europe. And then, um, the Asian carp problem started getting a lot of press, and people said, hey, they're detecting these bullfrogs over in France, and this eDNA method seems pretty cool. Let's, let's see if we can do something with Asian carp. And then 2011, we get this um, paper, Sight Unseen, using environmental DNA to detect Asian carp in the Chicago area waterway system. And this was really big, exciting news, except it was a huge problem. And this is where the controversial thing comes into play, because you'll notice on the author list for um, this 2011 paper here, there's not anybody from the Illinois state government listed in there. They, they were not working with the Illinois DNR. They were, there was not good communication, but they found this really exciting result with this new exciting technology, and the press got wind of it, and there was a huge uproar about, hey, there's Asian carp knocking on the door for the Great Lakes. And of course, all of the other Great Lakes states said, hey, Illinois, you guys have Asian carp coming into Lake Michigan there through your waterway system. You guys need to do something about this. And so kind of the state of Illinois was in a really difficult position because of this uh, finding. And so that's kind of the basis for how a lot of skepticism of eDNA was formed because we had this really um, exciting result brought to the press and it was not properly communicated and collaborated with the resource managers who are stuck there having to do something about this. And so a as a result of this, um, the state of Illinois did a huge effort to go in and kill all the fish and look for these Asian carp in the waters where they detected the DNA and they did not find them. So there were definitely some hard feelings about that. But it led to one positive outcome of realizing that we need to take a step back and evaluate like what can eDNA really do and how should we use it. And so there's this project put into place by the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee called ECALS, 
or eDNA calibration study, which was a partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Geological Survey. And we found that what's common knowledge today, that eDNA can be detected from carcasses, from bird feces after they've eaten eDNA. It can be transported by boats. Um, it can be detected on boats. Just by going out collecting eDNA samples, you can be contaminating your own samples if you're not careful about how you collect them. But going beyond that, just explaining what happened in 2011, we've also understood that eDNA mostly de uh, degrades in one to three days in the environment, although it can persist in trace amounts for longer than that. And in sediment, it can persist even longer than that. But we've also developed new, more sensitive assays that are more specific. So you saw the numbers that were reported just a few minutes ago, very low false positive, false, false negative rates because it's been greatly improved how we're actually detecting that. And we've also learned that um, kind of the decision validation that Adam laid out with detecting multiple assays. So these um, other sources of DNA of like a fish or being eaten by a bird and then the feces dropped into the water or being transported by boats or carcasses, that DNA is highly degraded. And you get these tiny fragments, which is what we're looking for on eDNA. But if you're assaying for multiple fragments from different regions of the mitochondrial genome, that um, gives you better confidence that you're detecting something that's been deposited more recently, is more reliable, and so for studies where we're looking at early detection in areas where we don't think there are uh, the invasive species that we're looking for, we really um, put forth extra effort in using multiple assays, doing genome sequencing as, or DNA sequencing as well to confirm that result. And very importantly, we know that um, repeatedly detecting the sample and having higher concentrations of DNA is much more meaningful than just a single detection out of, say, 200 samples, for example, or very low copy number DNA. So we have a much better understanding of what's a strong signal versus what's a weak signal, and the stronger signals are the things that we're more likely to um, advocate for action on. So. Having set all that up, I'd like to go over a couple examples of how we've worked as eDNA researchers with management agencies collaboratively and, and had a successful result. And one of those cases is with the New Zealand mud snail, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with as they were first discovered in the Snake River in 1987. They're a huge problem on the food webs. They can um, be easily transferred because they're so tiny and they can have uh, huge densities. And so they were discovered in 2013 in Wisconsin, in the Black Earth Creek. And so Wisconsin DNR contacted my lab and said, hey, we have this sighting, but they're really hard to find because they're so tiny and they hide underneath rocks and the surveys are very intensive and it takes us more than a year to collect those samples and then analyze them, what, what can we do eDNA to detect them? So we did a pilot study with them where we collected samples at 10 sites along the Black Earth Creek as well as some of the tributaries feeding into Black Earth Creek and we discovered with eDNA a second site about one and a half kilometers upstream of the known location using eDNA and we said, hey, there's a really strong signal here, you should go check out this site. And they did a week later and they found New Zealand mud snails at that site. So because we had that success, we then surveyed 75 samples across the state of Wisconsin and we also got some samples in Illinois and Iowa as well. And 
thankfully we found that they were not outside of the Black Earth Creek from the uh, sites that we tested. Although I will say that after we did that study, um, New, Ze New Zealand mud snails have been found in one more uh, stream in Wisconsin since then. Another example is the Burmese python in, in South Florida. So a group over at Gainesville led by Margaret Hunter um, is doing eDNA detecting Burmese pythons. And the picture here that you can see, this is an 18 foot python that was actually just captured a couple weeks ago. Um, these are a real problem because they get huge, 20 feet long, 200 pounds. You can imagine a big snake like that eats a lot and that eats a lot of mammals and birds and things that we want to see in the wetlands. They've been wreaking havoc in the Everglades down there. And they are very effective at crypsis. We can send tons of people out there looking for them and almost step on them and not find them. Literally, these things are basically only found when they're crossing roads. They get hit by cars, they even get hit by planes on runways. So they're really hard to find and a difficult problem. So it seems like an ideal situation for environmental DNA approach. And so what Maggie found was that um, the kind of northern limit for where they expected the snakes to be was this water conservation um, area number three here was what the, the expected distribution of the snakes was, but she worked with the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge and did eDNA sampling for three years in 2014, 15, and 16, and the green dots, you can see there's different shapes for each year, but you can see that up in the wildlife refuge, they were getting a lot of consistent, reliable detections of eDNA saying like, hey, there's probably something going on here. This is what we're looking for. And um, lo and behold, at, at the end of the study, they did actually start finding snakes in that wildlife refuge. So this is another example where eDNA found the snakes before they were actually captured. And then another example from my lab, Using, looking for the round goby. These are bottom-dwelling fish. They're a real problem because they prey on the native species of fish, uh, eating their eggs in the fry. They have some competitive advantages that our native species don't have, being that they can feed in total darkness. They eat zebra mussels, and so we know how bad the zebra mussels are spreading. They can follow right along and have a good food source. And they're very aggressive at defending um, the prime nesting habitat. So it's multiple reasons why they're a problem for our native species. And in Wisconsin, they're uh, threatening to invade Lake Winnebago. So this area right here is Lake Winnebago, and actually in my next slide here. Shows, shows the lake, but right upstream of that lake, there is a lock chamber that connects Lake Winnebago to the Fox River. And the gobies are all up in the Fox River, which runs from Lake Winnebago to Green Bay here. And Wisconsin DNR was posed with another problem here because that lock chamber, they closed down a few years ago to prevent the gobies from spreading into Lake Winnebago, which if they get into Lake Winnebago, that opens up a lot of access to many inland waters. So that's kind of the pinch point where they're trying to keep the gobies out of Wisconsin. But the problem is that Lake Winnebago is a highly utilized recreational water body in Wisconsin and there are a lot of marinas on the Fox River whose um, members want to use that lock chamber to get into Lake Winnebago. 
and since it's closed, they can't, they don't have that access anymore. And so they've been lobbying for a while now to try and get that lock chamber open back up again. And uh, two years ago, they actually contacted my lab and said, hey, we think that there's gobies in Lake Winnebago, and this is the reason why the lock chamber is closed. We want to do some eDNA to see if the gobies are there and basically negate the reason why this lock chamber is closed. And um, I proposed a research study to evaluate that to them, and you know they kind of went their own way, and they found another lab to do eDNA testing. But meanwhile, um, I spoke with some contacts in the Wisconsin DNR, and you know told them like, hey, this is going on. Um, are you guys interested in this? I want to make sure you guys are aware and you're involved in this process. And they said, well, yeah, actually, we do want to know that. And not only do we want to know if they're in Lake Winnebago, but we want to know if they're in some of these other areas where we've been getting angler reports of round gobies, but we have not been able to capture them ourselves to confirm it. And so we did a study with the Wisconsin DNR where we collected samples uh, in Green Bay where there's lots of round gobies present in a system called Kelly Brook where the round gobies are invading but at kind of a lower density than in the Fox River. We collected samples in the Fox River immediately downstream of that lock chamber, immediately upstream of the lock chamber in Lake Winnebago, and then a couple of upstream sites as well, and then um, the Wolf River where they've got some angler reports but they have not actually captured any round gobies. And um, they were kind of nervous about this because if, if we did get the detections in Lake Winnebago then there's some consequences that they'd have to deal with but they wanted to know the result and they wanted to know that it was done in a rigorous scientifically defensible way. So they proceeded to go ahead with this project with us. And uh, happily, we confirmed that there was no eDNA detections in Lake Winnebago or in the, any of the upstream sites, sites where there were not known to be round gobies. We did get uh, detections in Green Bay, in the Fox River, and in Kelly Brook, where they were known to be gobies. So everything kind of worked out. But, I think my point that I want to convey to you all is that you, eDNA is a mature science, as has been said multiple times, but the really important thing is having that communication line open so that you guys are involved in the process and so that um, when, when findings do come up, you guys can react appropriately, you can be um, aware of the situation before there's this huge press uprising and things that kind of pigeonhole you guys into doing something that may or may not be in the best interest for managing that resource. And so here's kind of three examples of how eDNA researchers and management successfully use this tool to have a good outcome. And so while that early detection is kind of a, an operational um, mode, except it's still continually being uh, improved as Gordon just presented on, there are some other newer things that are being developed that are still in full research mode, looking at monitoring abundance changes over time, so we know that if you have more speed, more of individuals in a water body, you're gonna get more DNA. Um, that relationship is demonstrated over and over again, but interpreting that is kind of a challenge, and so that's one area of active study. Another thing that was mentioned um, by Madeline was metabarcoding, metabarcoding to look at species assemblages, so looking at like everything that's out there um, through DNA sequencing, using high throughput sequencing. And then you can also get early detection of 
uh, invasive species through doing that as well. So it's, you kind of get more bang for your buck of studying the community of species that are in the water, but also getting the detections for the invasive species that way. We uh, have ongoing research to evaluate management actions. So control, we have control efforts to remove invasive species, collecting eDNA samples before and after to evaluate that population to see if it's having an impact. Same on restoring natural habitats to detect if you're having recoveries. Uh, project I'm working with Adam on actually out here using a robot to detect uh, eDNA at uh, stream gauge using robotic samplers that can do the collections for us continuously. Eventually the idea is that the robots will also be able to analyze the samples and just report out so that if you need uh, alert sent to you for a detections that might trigger a response. Um, that can all be automated once it gets set up. And then I also have another project using, developing a, a portable sampler that is really simple to use. So simple that we even had a 10-year-old run this test and detect Asian carp in a water body. And the idea is not to have 10-year-olds out doing our monitoring for us, but that'd be pretty sweet if they could. But it's a tool that you can work with um, homeowners associations or lake associations so that they can do their own monitoring and support you guys in, in the mission that you guys have because we obviously can't have boots on the ground in every single water body in the state, in every single state, but engaging that community through tools like this would be very helpful. And also, by the way, if a 10-year-old can do it, your regular field biologist that you hire for the summer can go out and test some sites and give you guys um, real-time results without having to wait for uh, working with a lab to do a full rigorous study um, just to get some kind of preliminary results that way as well. And I always like to show this on the Mississippi we want to keep our nice, beautiful waterways from becoming something like this, where we see in the Illinois River with Asian carp everywhere. And if not, I'll, if anyone has any questions or if we're ready to go into the discussion. We're ready to go into this discussion. Uh,